Welcome to the Growth Lab Podcast, where we talk about finding new clients, winning more contracts, and growing successful cleaning businesses. I'm your host, Matt Harris, and I run the Growth Lab. We partner with cleaning business owners to launch, accelerate, and scale the growth of their business with tried and tested systems and strategies that generate predictable revenue. If you're turning over at least six figures and you want to grow your cleaning business to seven figures plus, click on the link in the description and schedule a call. Now let's dive in. I am here with Matt Ricketts, Chief Experience Officer of Better Life Maids and also an advisor to Maid Central. Matt, thank you very much for joining me on the show. How are you doing? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Now, I normally kick off each episode just with inviting the guest to give a little bit of background and how what their cleaning journey has been like up to date. So if you wouldn't mind sharing, sure. that'd be great. Sure. So probably like everyone else that started a cleaning company and no, I'm kidding. I don't know. We, we started it. We started it a little differently. I was actually an airline pilot probably about 11, 12 years ago. I had gotten hired at Hawaiian airlines at 2008. We actually started it because we wanted to make a little extra money. And I don't know people that know this or not, but in the, in the States, when you, when you started an airline, usually it's a big pay cut from what you're doing. So we were looking like everyone else to, to oh, kind of, wow start something, start something, just kind of bridge that gap between what I was making and, and not. So it seemed like something we could do with some technology. We applied like online booking and, and tech 12, 15 years. Well, really this is almost actually 2008 now. We're actually, it's actually all the way back to 15 years ago. Now I'm losing track of time anymore. Yeah, no, <laughs> it goes quickly. So we were building tech like in the early part, cause that was kind of my hobby. And, and really quickly that cleaning company mostly focused on residential Kind of took off. So over the years, I've been, you know, I was able to step away from that career, career flying because this really did well. We were able to to scale this to a point where it became a lifestyle business for a while, and we just kind of rode the coattails until COVID, and we're just like, all right, that kind of changed the trajectory of what what I really wanted to do with this. I really changed a lot of my thinking around what these businesses could be, what they, yeah. where they're going. I got involved with the Made Central team. Made Central is a it's an ERP product. It's a enterprise resource planning, but scheduling, dispatch, all but all the things really that you would need to run a residential cleaning product. But it also does commercial, it does property management, all kinds of different functionality. But I got involved in that back in like 2018. My mentor, Tom Stewart, my kind of business coach. I mean, we all probably have people that help us up and bring us up in the industry. Yeah, He was on this product. And so I, I always helped him with marketing and, and sales and that sort of stuff. And he was always kind of my mentor on profitability and operations. He's a really strong operator. And I saw his software and I realized pretty quickly that I was leaving a lot of money on the table with the way I was doing things by very much focused on this very sales driven model Yeah, and, and not really focusing on a profit driven model. So I asked him, Hey, can I use your software? And he, he said, no, he's like, this is a private software <laughs> we're building for our enterprise. No, the answer is no. So I wore him down and I wore him down and he finally said, sure, but you can bait it. Cause maybe I want to sell this to other people someday. You and a few people can bait it. I got a, a few of us kind of got on board. I ended up being the second person. I regret that I didn't get on first, but anyway, we, we got on board with the software and quickly we were able to really use it to, to drive some change in our organization, to create really efficient routes, drive productivity with employees. And what that means is our average technician is making a lot more money. We were able to increase the revenue per day that they were, that they were generating, which this is a fun fact. We're about 50% bigger in terms of my Better Life Maids operation than we were in 2019, but we have the exact same number of technicians. We, my average technician makes almost 50% more, making almost like 22 and some change per hour in US dollars. And they're making their full health benefits, which I know your shows all over the world. That's that's not a very usual thing for a company yeah. in the States to offer. That's full medical, dental, vision. We have the, the profits to be able to afford that because of the way we're managing the business with technology. So long answer short is I've been in a lot of different roles in the industry in terms of leadership in trade groups like ARCSI and ISSA and other things. And then I'm just really interested in where the industry is going. I'm having a lot of conversations with people about what's next and where, yeah. where it's heading. 
That's interesting. I think for me, I would like to dig into a couple of things. So you mentioned moving from a sales model to profit model. Can you give us a little bit more granular detail? What were you doing before you spoke with Tom? And then what did he influence you in terms of changing with regards to your business model? So one of the things is that we would we were just very interested in closing deals, right? We weren't evaluating the jobs really as to like, we were, we were focused on vanity metrics. How many customers did we have? How many, how many technicians did we have? How many homes did we clean a month? All, all that stuff matters. But in the end, we weren't really evaluating the jobs. We didn't have the tools to do it. We weren't looking at every job and saying, did we hit the target hours? Did we do what we could have done to maximize that. So there, there would be jobs. When I finally came on to Made Central and was looking at it, we had about maybe 750 customers. About a third of my jobs were basically, we weren't hitting the allowed hours we were supposed to be hitting. We were actually going over consistently. And basically that was a drag on profitability. Those hmm. jobs, when we started increasing the prices on them, our average hourly rate per technician went up from like $47 an hour. We're over, we're over $65 an hour. And a lot of that wasn't just price increases. It was it was going after those lower price jobs that were kind of dragging down the bottom of profitability. We put a lot of time and energy into creating routes that are dense, that are much more efficient in terms of how the employee's time is used per day. So in, in, increasing what you can generate per employee per day, all those are important. And we're still a very sales-driven organization. We're, we're using made central for that as well. And we're selling online and, and over the phone, we're netting on average 15 new recurring customers a week. So we're growing. Yeah. We're, so we, I use the idea of like of revenue per week and stacking that up. We're growing on average about $900 of revenue per week. So let's just use a thousand because it's easier to do that math in your head. So every week we're adding roughly $52,000 in revenue and you just keep stacking that up. So at the end of a quarter, we're almost $500,000 bigger than we were the quarter mm. prior. So, and again, using that, that profit driven model to basically evaluate those jobs and to keep customers longer by using technology to provide them a better service. So we're, we're able to put in like really site specific scope of work, which is very common in commercial, but not very common in the res- residential side of cleaning. So we have it listed every room that we clean. We have pictures and notes and details about, about the homes. And mm-hmm. we're using scorecards to measure satisfaction and putting that, that last score readily, easily available for the technicians. They can also see the history of all of that on the job. So we're giving them more data to do their job well. So it's, it's a confluence of a lot of things, but yeah. really what it comes down to is it's not about vanity metrics. It's about what's left. And really the biggest thing is improving gross profits because I joke with people all the time about this, but it's like, if you're focused on what you're cleaning, like your, your, your software costs, that's so far below the line of what you're really spending. I mean, my company is, we were chatting about this previously, but it's, we're almost 80% of our costs are human, it's human capital. The labor side of direct labor is roughly 40%. Then you've got all the taxes and stuff and insurance and everything. So get that to 50% for, for COGS or whatever. But then for a fast growing organization, we've got layers of management and structure. And so mm. all the money in this industry is really on how you really manage the direct labor and and re- people get focused on what vacuums cost or even what software costs, things like that. <laughs> if the software can help you reduce your cogs, your direct labor, maybe even reduce that indirect labor by having less people in the office because you've got software answering your phones 24 hours a day. You've got yeah. automations happening that you used to do. We used to, we used to manually send out email reminders to all of our customers, 60 emails a day. And obviously that's fairly common in technology now, like the, that that's all happening. Yeah. But think about it, what it was five, 10 years ago, how we did those things. Yeah. Right. Time consuming and, and lack of efficiency there. Uh, yep. So has all of, has it, I'm guessing it, this has been like a, a gradual process with the, with the tech adoption within your business or, or was it, did you go from being driven by sales one day to then 
being completely focused on the profit side no it's the it's, other day as they, as they go of, hand in hand i mean you have to like we're very growth oriented as well but like sure. the tech I mean, we've always been a high tech company we've always had a lot of a lot of tech in our company in terms of things that i built but it was all kind of held together with bubble gum and duct tape because i built i built it and i had apis in the background between different softwares that i had paid developers to build and if any of that got gummed up one day then i would have to be cleaning that up and so so we, we've been tech focused for a long time but sure that was just mostly because i'm a tinkerer by nature and just like to do like stuff but it wasn't really like strategic the decision to do those things wasn't necessarily strategic in any Okay. way to like save time it was i think it was because we i liked doing it i liked building it but it wasn't a strategic decision a strategic decision was to say look we're doing two million dollars a year and i'm only making two hundred thousand dollars a year off this business mm. and my and my business coach is like matt you should be making two or three times what you're making off mm -hmm. of this business if you were if you were managing it properly you might have 20 percent less customers and be making that same amount of money too and, and not deal with all the headache or you could manage what you have well and and probably double what your take home is. Think of it like this. If you if you raise your customers' prices by five dollars, and let's say you had a, a net profit of of ten percent, right? Mm -hmm. And your and your bill rate was a hundred, right? You might and let's say that, that that five dollar was just like just a price increase that didn't go to your wage, didn't go to wages or anything like that. You you might basically have increased your your gross profit by fifty percent at that point because mm. that's just an extra five dollars per job. You're you're making a you're only making ten dollars per job more. I mean, it's an oversimplification of it, but looking for like the little changes on what each job is profiting you is really where all the money. It really where is where all the money is, and so we have. We have dispatch boards that we're looking at every single day and we have somebody on our team responsible to say, did that job hit its time? Did it not? Why? And then drive that down all the way to the team that did it, having conversations around what happened. Do we need to adjust that customer? Do we need to make changes? And not waiting until it's like the customer's gotten really comfortable with having you come and clean and with, with a rate <laughs> that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And from the very first cleaning, we're, we're making those evaluations and I know that's tougher on the commercial side because you guys bid it, you sign a contract, but I mean, there's tough conversations that can be had there with those where it's just, you got a 30 day out usually and just say, we're not making money here the way things are. Like we need to either change the structure of the cleaning, pull some things back, reallocate or raise the bill, right? Does that happen in, in commercial ever? Do you have to have those conversations? You do, you do, but not necessarily after uh, such a, a short time scale. So it'd be more likely either a quarterly or biannual once you have got a good gauge of the data. It, leading up to that process, there, there will be in communication with the client saying, look, this is where you were, either to get the, the quality that you want, we need to adjust the hours that have been quoted because we underestimated or that there were a few things that came into play which which we didn't anticipate at the time because they weren't raised to us or whatever the case may be but then it goes then it goes through a review process but certainly not not as quick as that so i think from your perspective like what what are some of the key kpis that you look out for during that 30 day period to then be able to assess look this is this is where the change needs to be made yeah so I mean, we use the idea of, so obviously the allowed hours versus versus what actually happened. We also use the idea of normalized time too. I don't know if this is common and this is a fairly, what we do is we look at the average productivity of that technician doing any other job. And yeah. so let's say that they're hitting the allowed hours in that job. It's a three hour job and, and it's taking them three hours. But if they're normally faster in, in most other situations, they're actually being slowed down by that job. So, we're, so we would actually apply like a normalized time to it and say, actually, mm -hmm. this job is taking them 3.5 normalized hours. So we, we actually use the software to kind of normalize time across technicians because they all have a little bit different productivity rates. And, and we're able to, with enough data, we're able to kind of normalize that time. So we're looking at the time. We're looking at the revenue produced per hour. We, we, have, a, we have a floor 
So we won't serve a customer if we can't make at least $60 an hour on that, like $60 per labor hour on that job. It just doesn't make sense to do the things that we do for our, for our employees with benefits and things like that to try and, to try and stretch those, those jobs. Those are kind of the two, those are kind of the two KPIs that are kind of the, the big ones yeah. in terms of price adjustments. So okay. there's other things that come into play though. So I guess if you're normalizing time, is, do you normalize time across the whole team or do you go as, as per team member? And so across, it, it, would, it would aggregate the data okay. across all the team members that have served that, that customer. We do a lot of solo work. I have had big contracts where I have had big contracts where we have like a multi team, like at a place five, six, seven days a week, sort of like, so we do do, we do commercial. Sure. But it's what we were describing this before. We only do commercial in the sense that it's what we call resimercial. It's places where people live. I like high rise apartments. I like retirement communities. I like places where we can clean during the day and I don't need to have teams out in weird hours and things like that. Yeah. And, and I, I like places where they actually value that the, that the employees look like professional, like, so like the quality of the people that are there interacting with the guests, the, sure. the staff matters a little bit more. So maybe we can get a little bit higher rate than we can from some other commercial jobs where they never see the, they never see the people. It's kind of invisible. So anyway, we, what I do oftentimes in those jobs is I'll break up specific functions by per by people. So I can actually measure it across an individual. So like, all right, you're doing this wing and you're responsible for it. So James, you have this and, and Precious, you have this and Katie, you have this. Mm. And so we'll break up those parts of the job and we'll start measuring their individual. So it, so it doesn't have to get as aggregated. So they'll, okay. we'll break parts of the job up and measure it across, across the individual. And then once we have that kind of baseline, we don't need it anymore and we can kind of aggregate it all together. But yeah, having, having your, a lot of our teams be solos, it's easy to kind of, get that information without trying to be like, well, they're with a trainee or they're with so-and-so, so they're being slowed down. So yeah. it is easier to get that data because most of our technicians do work individually. Okay. So I'm guessing then training is, is a big element of, of that and onboarding a, a new team member is, that's a crucial part in the process. What does that look like in terms of bringing a new team member on sure what what type of training do they go through do they need to like hit do they need to be able to clean within a certain time frame give me an example of what what yeah. that looks like so we have before they even start they have to complete like 12 hours of online training so i was one of the authors of the professional home cleaning program for issa it's a okay it's a home service technician so they they have to take that course. That's about an eight hour course. It covers things like surface surfaces, chemicals, safety, customer service, a, a whole gamut of things. There's, there's like four or five other authors on that program, but I was one of the authors on that. So we, we put them through that. Then there's mm -hmm. another four hours of kind of specific things that we do before they even show up. We've never even met this person in person. We're still doing all of our interviews over Zoom. So, so we're looking for that commitment that they actually complete the, the online training they show up for the first day and they're assigned with a trainer. Our, our trainer, our, our, we, have, we have six trainers in an organization of about 40 techs, but the trainers, there's, there's a lead trainer. We try and set everybody's first week with the lead trainer and then their second week with somebody else. Yeah, so they're, they're going in and learning our processes hands-on now. So they've, they've seen, all of, our, they've seen all, of, all of our videos that we've created that are how we do things, our processes, but now those are being applied hands-on in the field. So then they're kind of taking our playbook, right? Yeah. And going through that like page by page, like how to call a customer, how to, what, what the uniform looks like. So, so the videos are all broken down. They go out and they're going to be like, they're going to do how to do a shower. So they're going to break all that down in a, in a playbook like this yeah. and go out for about a week and learn all those processes. Okay. Week two, then they're the, the first week we're really not measuring the time we, we're assuming that that a that a technician is actually about fifty percent product productive by the end of week one that they're they're able to make some dent in the jobs that they have. Then week two, we're kind of starting to kind of on the job. They're learning how to be a solo technician, so they're going with another. They're getting assigned another trainer, 
and they're meeting this person now. So they're leaving from their house and they're meeting this person. They're, they're meeting at their jobs and they're going to, they're going to be in charge of checking into the job. And so using the tech to kind of see all the details of the job. And so their, their trainer is basically showing them how to, to, to operate on their own. By the end of week two, we expect that they would be able to hit about 80% productivity. Okay. So they would be able to, they would be able to hit the target of if it was a four hour job, we would expect them to be able to hit it in like 3.6 or I'm sorry, 4.4. They would go over, they would go over some by about the third week. Most of them are, most of them are getting into the 90% to hundred percent productivity range. Mm -hmm. So the way we sell, the way we sell is we're assuming productivity for a three to six month employee. So over time we expect our, our technicians to have 110% productivity because those numbers we sold at, we're based on a baseline of a of a fairly average newer employee, three to six months. So sure. within a within a month, a lot of them are are really grasping the system. We are on a commission based structure, so we have a guarantee, like a floor that they can't go under. Yeah. But we we don't want to pay them supplemental after about a month. We we expect that they're going to be generating everything that they need from the the commission rate that they're going to get. And okay. not need to get supplemental pay. And the commission rate is based on them being the increase in their efficiency, their productivity. So, so, yeah, and I, I could share. We've got a we've got a career ladder that kind of describes a little bit of this. Can I do a visual really quick? Would that help? Yeah, yeah. I guess it's um, hard because you're going to do this as a podcast too. But I can give the page for people that want to look at it. So it's um, going to be betterlifemades.com forward slash employee resources. So this is this is on our employee resources page. So when they're starting out, they're they're an apprentice. They have a job share. They're 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 just getting hourly. Two to four weeks they're in this program. Productivity average about 85%. We we get them by four, week four almost to that 100 percent productivity they have other standards they have to meet. So we have scorecards that go out to our customers. They need to maintain at least a 90% while they're in this technician role. That's like bare minimum just to, to make it here. Productivity, attendance score of 70%. That, that's not that they're here 70% of the time. We're giving them like, Made Central has a scoring system based on whether they're late. Even if, okay. even if they've, if they, if they take days off the way they're supposed to, but they, but they're taking a lot of PTO, it yeah. can it can negatively affect their score. So this is kind of wow. don't worry about that number if you're not using the software. But it's a number that they have objectively they can look at in their customer portal. So yeah. then they have so they're then they're at thirty six percent job share. After about let's see what do we say for advanced tech? I don't know if we have the time frame here. Let's see how long do you have to be? 3 plus months. We can they can they have the opportunity to come up to 37%. That increases their on target earnings to 2165. Part of that is an increase in this. Part of it is because their productivity has increased a little bit as well. Okay. And so they're starting to earn they're starting to earn more. Typically they're participating in all the 401k, healthcare, any of that stuff that they want to participate in. Yeah. And it doesn't take long if but this is actually harder than than it looks. So to get to this master tech, we'll allow someone to get here if they came in with other experience. But the hardest part of this is they've got to maintain 32 allowed hours per week of billable time to okay. become a to become a master tech. So that again that bumps them up to this higher 38%, but we would they, we would expect that they would have 110% of productivity, really great attendance, and that they're they're doing roughly six plus hours every day yeah. on average, even with their on their days, not including days off and things like that. So it's the data is all there for them to see in their portal. The scorecard part is also really important as well. So. Made Central sends out scorecards every day to customers. You can turn it off or on. But the the benefit is for residential is is that you might not be going there for three three or four more weeks. You need to know right away if there's a problem. If you're going to a commercial place and you kind of mess something up the night before, every day is kind of a reset. Yeah. Every every day with residential, it's a job audition. It really, I mean, it really is. Like hmm. it's much, it's much 
more tenuous of a relationship. So you need to be measuring it every opportunity you get. So all of this, all of this is managed by the tech. So I'm guessing like the, the use of the app is, is central from a technician's perspective and certainly helps with regards to, to management as well. Right. So yeah, they're, I mean, they're very self-directed in terms of we'll have dashboards up and they'll, we're not having to worry about whether people come into a central place and clock in. We'll have a dashboard up in the morning and it'll just, anything that goes red means somebody's late. And then we'll check in. We'll check in with anybody that went red on that dashboard and jobs that are falling behind throughout the day. We'll get notifications and we can communicate with the team, communicate with the customer that we're running behind. But for the most part, a lot of things are happening for them automatically. When they check into a job, things start happening in the background for them. When they check out of a job, it'll send the text message to the next customer saying that they're on the way. They have the ability to adjust that if they want to take a lunch. A lot of kind of background stuff is happening for them as well. That's that's kind of managing their day. If they're uploading pictures into the portal for up for upcoming jobs and things like that, it's uploading those into future jobs based on settings that, that the company does. It's But it's really easy for them to self-manage their day. What it also does, though, is it allows them to go into a central place where this is linkable to there. This is our employee resources tab. They have a link here to other resources that they need, but they also have, they can see their pay. So Made Central mm -hmm. allows them, it's one place that they really need to operate. So they can go into it, they can go to their payroll tab and they can see job by job, day by day, what they made, especially if you're doing a commission structure system, your yeah. employees have to understand it. They have to understand how they make what they make. And so they can see, all right, I made $32 an hour on this particular job. It was a small job, but I was very efficient. I was very productive in my time there. And for this day, I made $22 an hour. I didn't have much drive time. I didn't take a bunch of breaks because it'll show them the clock time versus the job time and the, the spread. And and the more the more there's a spread there, the the more likely it is that they could have a lower hourly rate. So they can start to understand that. So they're really a, a different kind of employee than we might have had 10 years ago. They're, they're all tech savvy. So my next question is really, uh, obviously the, the tech has played a, a key role in, in, I'm guessing, developing your, the management system of your business. How, how has that evolved over, over the last sort of 10, 15 years? And what, what was the biggest challenge with that as well? Yeah, so, I mean, what it really has done, it's allowed us to have developed a core set of KPIs that we can look at and and know where our business is going based on those individual numbers. Like if our customer attrition is higher than we like, that's a killer because customers leaving out the back door, it's really hard to replace them with sales. And so is there a service delivery problem? Is there a is there an issue with that? If our if our revenue per tech per day is going down, do we have a lot of techs taking off or like a lot of sick days is mm. unexcused absences, things like that, that like really require us to have a higher levels of staffing than we, than we would otherwise do. So we've, we've created this whole core set of KPIs that, that are going to tell us if we make small adjustments in one area, massive impacts can happen in terms of growth and in terms of profit and profitability. So we've really been able to, I don't want to say predict the future because you can't predict the future, but sure. I have a, I have a pretty good sense where my business will be in 90 days. Past that, it's really like, I have, a, I have a goal. Like we put it on paper. We say, these are our, these are our, these are our goals and such. I don't know if you, it's hard to read because of the blurring, but I can, I can look at these and say, this is where we're going to be in a year. A lot of things that, a lot of things can happen between here and between here and there. But yeah. with almost precision, I can say in a quarter, we're going to be, we're going to be here because of the data that we have, the information, okay. and we can make better we can make better management decisions. And then the other part of it is leadership management and accountability. You can, you can hold people accountable to their numbers all the way down through your organization. So your technicians, everybody, so everybody has a number in my company. Everybody has a number or a metric that they're responsible for their own okay. scorecard for say. So maybe it's four or five metrics. So for me, I still own some of the marketing metrics. I still own how many leads came in, because I'm still the main interface with our with our agencies and things like that that are sure. that are doing a lot of this. And when I was doing the when I was leading the sales team for Made Central, it was 
How many, how many demos did we do of the software this week? How many of those turned into contracts? We were doing a lot of outbound at the time. So how many, I, I owned how many first contacts we had, all, the, mm. all those metrics, but everybody has a scorecard. Everybody has a unique metric that they're responsible for and that they own all the way down to technicians. So, and, and they're held accountable to that. Now your technicians don't need to have weekly management meetings if, if done right, if they can see that data in front of them. But we have quarterlies with them where we, where we basically make sure that we get alignment with them, where we talk a lot about the, the values of the company, what our fo- just bring it all back into focus for them of what we're doing, why we do this. And we try and drive that with technology as much as we can, but we do have to have some in-person meetings once a, once a quarter. <laughs> yeah. Once a quarter we get together, we do a big breakfast at a local restaurant where we bring everyone nice. together and, and kind of go this stuff, kind of a pattern interrupt of all the tech kind of sure. doing it for us, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, we do. The technology has changed in the sense of of driving down accountability, different layers in the business. We're all the way down to technicians where they're responsible for their quality score. They're responsible for their productivity number and they're responsible for their attendance score. We don't hold them responsible to their efficiency completely because efficiency is a two way street. It's how efficiently did we schedule them and how efficiently did they use the time in between. We are coming up with a new metric called non MPT factor, non-productive time factor. Mm. This is getting maybe into the weeds too much, but it's <laughs> the idea is if, if it said they were going to have a fifth, like 15 minutes of non-productive time. Yeah. Did they have, did they have 40 minutes? And so you would give them, you'd basically give them a score based on how well they used what was scheduled to be non-productive time for the day. So if they were supposed to only be off 15 minutes, did they clock out for their lunch? If they didn't, their MPT, like their score would be way off. So we're going to start scoring that for them as well. And that's going to be a metric they're going to be responsible for. That's probably three to six months away, but we're working on that kind of metric now. And how do you deliver that? When you make a change like that, which is obviously managing performance and also puts an added level of responsibility onto the team. How do you deliver that to them? How We we generally do any big rollouts in the quarterly meeting where we'll describe what's changing. You'll see some new things in the app. We try and give them time for change. It's been a little while since you've been in the business, but I think you would remember that our techs, at least in my business, and maybe this is a States thing, but part of what makes them really good at their job is that there are people that aren't really, they really don't love change and like they're Mm. very stiff, like, but also sometimes like in their lives growing up, like change meant a bad thing, a new apartment or a new school. It wasn't like maybe a new dad. I mean, all the bad things that happen with change. So like you could be giving them a raise and sometimes people would be like, I don't know that's different. <laughs> I never came across that. I'll be honest, man. No, <laughs> when, we when we went to commission <laughs> and people were going to make way more money with it if they followed the system, some people lost their minds. Like, we were paying hourly and some people were just really like, really mad at us about that. And we're like, we guarantee, because we have a we have a floor, we guarantee you won't make less than that. But then they're like, it just feels like you're forcing us to work faster. It's like, you can still make your hourly. We're just measuring it now. We're just putting all this into place. Yeah. So people people were, I mean, people, people were mad. We were giving them an opportunity to make 25, 30% more per hour. And they were people that were mad. So wow. yeah. that's nice. Changes, changes is... Change is, is not easy for everyone. No, it's not. And certainly, we've been talking a lot about measuring performance and KPIs and, and how tech has played a, a central role in, in your business. And, and certainly, the, the change is, is coming if, if it's not already here, right? They're yeah. ultimately within both the home cleaning industry and, and certainly within commercial. Probably commercials is, might be a little bit ahead. I, I don't really know. I've been out of the game for a little while. But I mentioned before we went on, you guys in the States, in terms of home cleaning on the tech front, as far as I'm aware, you're leaps and bounds ahead of what's happening over here. I think home cleaning, domestic cleaning businesses over here have been relatively slow in in adopting tech. Now, I might get a few disgruntled people messaging me and saying, that's not right, we use this and that, but that's kind of the, the general impression that I get and from having spoken with a few people who run their own home cleaning business. So how, what else do you, do you think is, is going to come for 
the home cleaning industry from a tech perspective over over the next sort of let's say three years what what are the changes do you see on the horizon so in the immediate future i think what's going to happen is there's going to be a lot more self-service tools for customers that are going to be coming out that's going to be a big push from made central so rolling out we already have a customer portal but giving it more and more functionality where they can manage their schedule. This is going to freak some of the people out where <laughs> they can reschedule their own cleanings and they can add notes to their job just like right from their device. That's going to take jobs away from some companies or they're going to have to find new ways to deploy internal labor because they're going to be a lot of the like things that the customers were calling in or texting in or, or whatever they're doing are going to change. And in the States, it's getting harder and harder to reach customers because the texting, like AT&T just did, I don't know who your carriers are over there, but AT&T is a big one here. AT&T did this big change where you had to register all of your text numbers and all this stuff. And they were blocking like 20, 25, 30% of all the texts that were coming through on their carrier unless oh, you wow. did all this all this process. And, and so making a customer portal that A, that then the customer wants to download into an app. And now, now you can reach them on this device whenever we want. Now yeah. it's a tool, so it's not a distraction for us. It's, <laughs> we can push out notifications to the customer like, hey, your cleaning texts are on the way. So instead of relying on other parties now, I mean, we're still relying on the, the phones and the, and the software of those devices, but we're, we're tightening our relationship with the customer and, and just, just intermeshing it so that it's tougher and tougher for them to leave the service companies that are using mm. these high-tech tools. I don't know about your age group, and I'm, I'm 43, so we grew up with a computer in my house, but most people most people below my age all did. And, and mm. a lot of them had phones growing up, like people in their 30s got their first phone when they were kids and stuff like that. I didn't get my first phone until I was probably, I was in college, I got, I got one I paid way too much for, but the, <laughs> it wasn't one of those briefcase ones, I'm not that old, it was you know, a little bigger than they are. I had a Nokia, whatever it was, seventy two ten. I think that was that was one of my first ones, which was which was relatively bricky, but not not yeah. an eighties phone brick. But they don't even want to call you to do. They don't even want to pick up their phone and call you. They want to go on on your website. They want to know the price. They want transparency. They want to know what's available. And and then they're also. I mean, this is all stuff you're all doing now. But they're they're gonna want, they're gonna go out and check your references online. They're not gonna. They're not going to ask you for references. They're going to look for your reviews and your yeah. and your your trust signals online. Most of us are already doing all of that really well, but that's going to lead to to faster velocity of sales. So, twenty five percent of my sales are done online today without a single interaction with oh, that wow. customer. I okay. see that being fifty percent in the next three years. I see that. So, even even two or three years ago, my my stats on my website were still skewed towards towards desk or computer browsers versus phone. Yeah. Now it's like 80% phone browser like finds our website. Like mm. so so all of this is going to be building tools that your your customers can deal with you from their phone but not from a phone call, right? Sure. Like it's going to it's going to really push towards that. It's going to really push towards that you're going to have to compete on labor in, in a way that's never happened before. So you're going to have to have tools that allow you to be really efficient in how you schedule so you can maximize the return on, I, I, I don't know that everyone loves this word, but I, this word return on human capital. The cleaning industry has one of the lowest return on human capital. So what I mean by that is how much revenue can you generate per employee? Yeah. And, and we talked about pest and pest could be $1,000 a day. Yeah. We're $2,000 a day. We're lucky if we can generate five, $600 with our best employees in the home cleaning space. So it's, usually a 4x return on human capital in some, other, in some other industries. I have friends in plumbing, and if they're not generating $350,000 per employee per mm -hmm. year, they're, they're not happy. Now, now mm -hmm. not all that's labor charge. That's, that's, a, that's materials and everything sure. else that goes into it. But they're, they're getting markup on materials as well. So maybe 20 30% on material too. So what's the best case scenario for, for us today, for the average company, I can, I can tell you because I have the data from doing it. Most companies are around $50,000 per technician per year in the States. Mm -hmm. My company is close to 100,000. So we're doubling that and, and that's creating better jobs for our employees. And it's not, it's not necessarily because we have much higher prices. It's because we're, 
we're looking at those numbers in every single job and making sure that the work we're doing is the right kind of work for the model that we're running and the, the profits that we want to generate, but also for the wages we want to create for our employees. Because if we have underpriced crappy jobs, yeah, that just rolls to them first. I mean, they're, yeah. they're the first one to absorb that. They're going to a job, it's supposed to take them three hours, it takes them four. They're making less money, they're less happy. So all, all stakeholders have to win. So that's the future too. It's like, you're building this company around a three stakeholder model, which is obviously you as the, the company and, and, and other owners and, and stakeholders in your company, your, your technicians and your customers. So the tech, the tool, everything's kind of merging towards, I believe, a three stakeholder model. And, and longer term, I mean, those are just some of the, those are some of the littler things. I think a lot of, a lot of other stuff in terms of what's happening is you just, just really a lot of tools for employee engagement keeping yeah. employees longer, reducing turnover. In the States, the average turnover for the home service industry is close to about 300% per year. That's kind of normal. That's been normalized mm. for years. Huh. It's it's really bad. Food service is the same way. It's just churn and burn. And it's not that like, a lot of people say, oh, my turnover is not that bad. It's because they're not measuring all the hires that they start that don't make. It's really that first 30 days yeah. that a lot of that happens. But there's a lot of expense in that. So yeah. driving that down, reducing that churn and burn mentality and investing in people through the right tools, through feedback loops, that's going to be valuable. Longer term, I see that the home service industry is, there's a lot of money that wants to come into it. You're starting to see it in plumbing, HVAC. You're starting to see it in, I don't know if it's happening in, in the UK. Can you? Talk about that. It was like, are you seeing like a lot of like roll ups and things like that happening? Yeah. So I mentioned before we went on, I, I had an interview with Rune Sonval from Fantastic Services, and that that's something that his business has been doing for uh, close to fifteen years. So they started off in cleaning, and then they expanded into gardening, window cleaning, removals, and now they're they're full service, right? So anything you need from a home service perspective, you can access on their app at the touch of a couple of buttons. And I, I think certainly that is more of the direction that, that things are going in because it, it, it comes down to convenience, doesn't it? It comes down to me being a customer. I don't really want to spend an extra 10, 15 minutes on Google looking at different reviews, trying to find the best rated plumber in my local area when I know that the service provider who already cleans for me, who already cleans my windows, who, who's already doing my gardening, they're able to provide that the touch of a button. So, so that's great. I think, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I think that that is, is definitely the way it's going. And, and you mentioned pest, and this is what we spoke about before. Cleaning out of all of the home service, out of all of the home services, it's probably the, the, the least profitable out of, out of all of them. So really, it, it kind of makes sense to roll that up into a suite of services because then you're almost becoming, I, I mentioned this as well, you're almost becoming like a residential facilities management business, right? So I see it. we can do I, I everything. Had, had a conversation with somebody in the States this week that's interested in creating a, a, a business like what you described. I, I was kind of thinking they were getting ahead of themselves, but now after seeing it, I was thinking maybe that's like three, five years, like down the road, build your base first. And yeah, what, what I'm, I'm getting approached every week by private equity that want to have conversations about either buying or partnering with better life maids. And I'll take the meetings because I want to hear what they have to say. And I want to listen and learn. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is they believe that our industry is valuable because we have the keys to the home. Yeah. Right. We're, we're there at a very high frequency and there's an opportunity. You have a garage door company. You might see that person once every decade because a lot of people don't even service their garage doors. They just like, I don't know if that's a common thing. And we have these electronic garage doors in, in, the, in the States. People just buy them and forget about them, but they need some like, kind of, like some regular maintenance. If you had, the, if you had your, your home cleaner coming in and out to the door and be like, hey, that's kind of squeaky, squeaky. We could have Mm. The we could have the the garage door techs come take a look at that. We'll schedule we'll schedule that for you. They could leave a note after the visit. They notice that there is something not working. Hey, this circuit's not working. We can have somebody come out and look at it. Or there's a dripping faucet. 
so much of those home services the homeowners would want to do. They just, they don't have time to deal with. So you can actually be the one to notice it, the one to actually bring forward tickets mm. and, and drive revenue. So I, my vision was that's three to five years away, away. We're going to start to see some real big consolidation industry. Sounds like some people are starting to make that happen sooner than that. And they're going to, yeah. they're going to be again, driving the entire gamut of, of the relationship with the, with the, the customer. So one last thought on that is, is that you don't even have, it's not even about price either. Cause Amazon's Amazon is not the cheapest. Mm. Like you can buy almost everything on Amazon and usually you can probably find a better deal someplace else. I mean, almost anything that Amazon sells, there's a better <laughs> price someplace else. But you have to look, right? That, that's, <laughs> that's the thing. The Extra the two, three, four minutes. That, that is, that's where we're at now. Like, what is it? Ronnie Cheng, he's got a, a skit on Netflix in one of his specials where he says, I want Amazon now. Put it in my hand now. I want everything now, right now. That's, and that's, that's, that's what it is. That's where, that's where we've gone to. And, and the same is going to happen to this industry because everything is about speed and convenience. I think technology is going to be put in the hands of some of the smaller players and they're going to be able to compete. It, it's going to it's going to level the playing field to some degree The the wild card is, and it's happened several times in our industry and people have come in and failed. So people are, people are really hesitant to like get, they, they don't, they're not going to like necessarily buy and believe that. Like, so like Amazon and Google have already kind of tried to come into the home services in the States and they've, they've come and gone home. Joy was a big one, but it's because they weren't focusing on the right stuff first. They weren't building the operational foundations first. They were just basically, we're a tech company that sells cleaning. If you're a tech company hmm. that is well managed and utilizes tech and has good financial modeling, that's a different game than a tech company that sells cleaning. So that I do believe is the shift that will that will start to occur. There will be there will be some really big cleaning companies that that start to have opportunities to be home management companies for all the services that can run yeah. through a home. Yeah. And so just before we start wrapping up, because I, I appreciate we've been on for nearly an hour. Yeah. I've got one more question, then I've got a couple of quick fire questions, if you don't mind, Matt. So sure. before we went on, you mentioned that obviously you've got a plans to to grow better life maze. Like what 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 do those plans look like? How how do you how do you envisage growing from where you are now to where you want to be in sort of three to five years time? So it's, it's organic growth for the most part with some M&A opportunities that come along. So we've basically got a repeatable marketing engine that we can put in a certain dollar and get XYZ back. The long-term value of a customer in residential cleaning is, is typically in the range of depending on how well you manage your service, six to fifteen thousand dollars a big, big range, right? So sure. we, we we manage somewhere in the middle of that we're doing we do a pretty good job, but because we sell at such velocity, some customers kind of fall, kind of fall. So so we have the sales and marketing engine and operation engine to do that. So organic growth for the next two to three years was what I was thinking until I start seeing all these competitors coming in, <laughs> getting to the eight to ten million dollar range. At that point, we're generating at ten million. We're generating almost two million dollars of free capital every every just free cash flow mm. every year. That's where I would consider going into the M and A space and and looking at other opportunities for companies that want to come on. I would ideally bring them on with equity and give them stock in a in a bigger business and a bigger venture. Yeah, and bring on talent into the organization. People that are talented and passionate about the industry. That's that's three to five years away. That's what I'd like to to envision. But the three year goal is let's get to let's get to eight to ten million. Eight, eight million is kind of the bottom of the goal. Ten million is kind of the that's kind of the spot we'd like to be. But yeah. I'll be okay if we hit eight. And along that way, we we focus on our values. We stay focused on our on our core focus right now, which is really to provide just the residential services for now. But yeah. looking for those opportunities, looking for those opportunities as they kind of arise in the marketplace. And then the the bigger piece, I guess, is just the bigger piece is just focusing on 
on those those outcomes are is the is the company successful are the customers getting what they want and are the employees getting what they want if we fo- if we focus on those kind of three st- those three stakeholders in this early stage of what's next i think we'll we'll get what we want and and grow because growth just for growth's sake it's not that's not <laughs> what it's about like for me it's about the opportunity that's going to create for more employees to move up in the company it's for us yeah. to leverage economy of scale to deliver a better service to our customers and then to use that economy of scale for the company to keep growing. So every, everybody wins if some of this happens. It's, it's, good for, it's good for everybody, really. Yeah, for sure. And just out of curiosity, what's your primary customer acquisition strategy? Like what, what do you guys focus on? Um, Is it a lot online? Do you like referrals? What, all, what's the... Almost all of our, our ad spend. So we'll, we'll spend 10% of revenue right up. I think digital is the place to go. So again, I had a, a company that I was talking to that was, they're talking about creating like a, a roll up similar to what we were describing where they were going to do yeah. all the home services and they wanted to go to TV and they were talking about television advertising. And, and so I went, I was like, to me, if you're looking at a, like a branding play, Facebook is a better value. I can, I can reach the same number of customers that you can reach at the same frequency for a tenth the price. So for if it costs you a dollar to reach a customer ten times or seven, like I think we were using seven as the number, the kind of rule of seven. I think we were saying seven times over a three-month period to 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 reach that consumer. Mm-hmm. I can do that for eight cents on Facebook. So okay. Facebook is a undervalued platform for a lot of companies because it takes a lot of work. It's yeah. like, you've got to build content, you've got to create yeah. new videos, you've got to tell stories and be engaging. That's hard for people. They, maybe chat GPT will make that easier. We, maybe yeah. Get whole <laughs> yeah, show, maybe. Show on that, but maybe that'll change everything. I was playing around with some copywriting with that the other, the other day. I was like, wow, it's a better copywriter than me and I'm a pretty good copywriter. <laughs> and anyway, so I consider myself a good marketer and I was like, it's pretty good copy. I'll use I'll use number five yeah. of the game. Yeah. Uh, so so Facebook is strong, and then AdWords is AdWords is where we spend probably the most money. I mean, mm. again, AdWords is not just a set it and forget it thing either. It's it's an actively managed process of of making consistent improvement in your ads, the landing pages. There's there's multiple steps along the conversion funnel, and then internally, like you need to a contact those leads have a high contact rate and quote a high percentage of those right yeah turn a high percentage of those and, and know what your percentage in your funnel breakdown is it's not really your question but it it only works though any channel only works if then the rest of the funnel really adds up to being like a, a cost per acquisition you can live with and yeah. everyone always thinks like oh those are so expensive it's like well maybe because you're not contacting enough of them and turning them into quotes yeah or yeah. maybe it's because you're not turning enough of those quotes into sales So try, and then you have to measure every step along the funnel to see where there's any breakdowns. And it's oftentimes not in the leads. It's in how many times you contact those leads. I see that more than anything. Oh, we we called them twice. Okay. 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 So you need to put a bit more effort in that, in that respect. But no, that's cool. So look, Matt, before we sign off, I've got a couple of quick fire questions. The first is what advice would you give to a younger version of yourself just starting out with your cleaning business? When you get to two million, don't get too comfortable for five years and just hang out. So <laughs> nice. stay uncomfortable. Good bit of advice. Yeah. Uh, and the last one is: What three non-negotiable skills do you think are essential to growing a successful cleaning business? Oh wow, that's a tough answer because I see there's a lot of different personalities that are successful in, sure. in doing this and then having different types of businesses. For you though, for you, for like what 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 have been some of the the core elements that have driven your success? So for me, as much as I'm a numbers guy, I'm a people like just, just understanding that like people are unique, like the unique situations of people. So, I mean, there's a people business first. So getting, not getting lost in the data and like putting people first. I think that's an incredibly important skill and just recognizing like every story in your organization, every person, and there'll be people that'll come and go. There'll be people that disappoint you. But regardless, don't get jaded. Like, like, keep like, just don't let your heart get hard to all that stuff. Like, 
I don't know. So I, I don't know what that skill is, but just focusing on the the human all the human all the business. Yeah. The customers understanding their stories and the stuff they're going through, and not taking like things personally when they're upset. All of that is just it's developing a skill, your right? emotional intelligence, right? That, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a skill I see people go off the handle about, like on something that's just like let it go. And I again, maybe me ten years ago didn't have the same emotional intelligence, the same skill. But that's been really important to my to my personal growth is just like that, like kind of just understanding of like the human side of the business. I do think if you're going to get past a certain size, you have to know, you're, everyone says you have to know your numbers, but you have to even identify what are the core KPIs that you can control in your business and, and the outcomes that they achieve when you make changes to your business. So, so for me, there's 15 core KPIs. We're reporting on them weekly. We're going through them. We're making sure that they're on track. A weekly blip is not a big deal, but two weeks in a row, yeah. that might be something that we're gonna that we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper on. So, don't know what that skill is as, as much as it is just know knowing your numbers. numbers. Yeah, just know your numbers, know what, numbers. What they are. <laughs> every business is every business is different, and then yeah. I, I think. The other one is it's it's kind of three things. It's LMA, leadership management accountability. It's it's all kind of wrapped into one thing to me where it's like people like to work in a place where they have goals and they're accountable. I, I at least I do. Yeah. And the kind of people that I want working for my company do. So for me, LMA, leadership management accountability, it's it's a skill that oftentimes the A part is is left off people have like these big visions so they're great leaders they're like getting people excited about stuff and but then they're not managing the process of getting there like that's the boring part yeah managing managing is boring i think peter drucker said it like a well-run factory is the most boring place in the world i think (laughs) i could be getting the quote wrong but that's basically a peter drucker quote i think and and management is boring good management is boring but but like looking at the numbers and holding people accountable to what their scorecard is it's a skill that a lot of people don't put into practice because it's uncomfortable to hold people accountable, but it's also a little bit boring to kind of week after week. We talked about that number last week. Yeah. It's still important, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I guess that people find it uncomfortable because it goes a little bit it, counter to the first point you made, right? Emotional intelligence. Like if you're, if you're building relationships, then to have any sort of not necessarily conflict, but to have like a a bit of resistance and to be able to like not beat someone into shape, but like pull them up by the socks is, is, is hard. Right. And that, that's not, not everyone's cut out for that, unfortunately. But, but, but it leads to healthy and resilient organizations, healthy and strong. So it's unhealthy to let somebody fail at a job that they would be happier doing something else. at. It's unhealthy to keep someone in your organization. I see people do it, and especially in leadership roles, they promote people above their skis and give them titles and things like that, that they're not qualified to take their business to the next level. And those are uncomfortable things because those people have been with you the whole time. That doesn't mean you're gonna lose them. It just means that they're probably at the level that they're gonna be at, Mm. but they're not qualified to be your COO, right? Like all the the tough things, like that's why I'm I'm not big on giving people C-level titles. I don't think I'm a a company that needs C-level titles at this point. But my point being is like, it's wrong to do that to people too. And, and it's, they, they get it, they want it, but do they have the capacity to, to do the job that you're giving them? And if they don't, and you're not holding them accountable to it, it's bad for everybody, especially them and your company too. You're, you're all going to, you're all going to suffer for it. So most people, most people sigh a breath of relief when you actually hold them accountable to the things and and I think, at least in my organization, I've seen that. I mean, there are people that just, that's not the right fit for, and they're probably, they're not for our company then. So, yeah, but, and that's better for them too, though. Yeah, for sure. Then it goes back to your, your values and, and your mission and everything as well, because they need to have buy-in, right? To make sure that you've got that resilient organization that yeah. allows you to, to grow into what you need it to grow into or what you want it to grow into. Yeah, so that's I, think cool. that's, I think that's true. Having that culture... And, and those are non-negotiables. People talk about that stuff all the time. And we used to, so we used to have integrity in, in our, in our kind of core values. And I, it's obviously important. It was integrity is our legacy, but the point isn't 
that because nobody would ever go and be like, if you ever asked somebody, was, was that in full integrity? Everyone would be like, I'm in very, I have, I have integrity. I'm like, no one would ever say anything less about them. So most, most are, even people that are doing kind of crappy stuff. But we, we changed that to entrusted, which is to be worthy of other people's trust hmm. because it's, it's, it's almost more than integrity. It's like, it's like we, we, we do all of that. That's like table stakes. Like you expect anyone we hire has integrity. So, but yeah, like to your point, it's just the values that you shape for your company, the people, if they don't meet them, they should be uncomfortable. They should, they shouldn't be there. So, yeah. Well, look, that's a nice place to, to wrap it up, Matt. Before we go, where can people find out more about you online? Yeah. A lot of great information about what I talked about is going to be on madecentral.com. Yeah. A lot of webinars and videos and things that we're talking about, about productivity, efficiency. There's some nice downloads there on calculators on how to kind of calculate a lot of this stuff that we, that we do on a daily basis, even if you're not using Made Central. Some KPI kind of guidebooks and things like that. So that'd be a great place. And you can find me on Facebook. I'm usually in the Made Central Facebook group. So join that if, nice. you're, if you're out there and looking for some, some good information about the residential cleaning world. There's lots of great experts on there, not just me too, though. Perfect. Nice one, Matt. Well, look, this has been a really insightful show. So I appreciate you giving me more than an hour of your time. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks to Matt for, for joining us and uh, we'll see you guys in the next episode thanks to you guys for listening to the growth lab podcast you can access the show notes and free resources via the link in the episode description and if you got some value from this podcast please pay it forward and share it with others across social media or leave a rating and review on whatever podcast platform you listen to as it would really mean the world to me hope you enjoy and subscribe and i'll see you in the next episode